too cold. Let's shake it off. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. Can you turn to someone else and say, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy and at his right hand pleasure evermore. Let's begin to appreciate God for bringing us to this, to his sanctuary this evening. For yet another opportunity to be in his presence, to worship at his feet, to glorify his holy name. There is no higher calling, no greater honor than to bow and kneel before your throne. I'm amazed at your glory, embraced by your mercy. I live to worship you. There is no, there is no higher calling, greater honor, greater honor than to bow and kneel, and kneel before your throne. Oh, I'm amazed, I'm amazed at your glory. Spirit, can we just lift our hands to heaven this night and let's just bless the name of the Lord, give him praise from the depth of your heart. Just bless his name because he's God all by himself. And let's ask him to come and reign. Let him come and reign in Nigeria, let him come and reign in the church, let him reign in our lives, let him reign in our
Welcome to the month of June 2020. I hope you had a good May 2020. As you know, month the month of May is considered the month of grace, the number five. I pray that God's grace was abundant in your life and God's grace will continue in your life. As we enter a new month, I believe that you will experience the newness of God also in Jesus' mighty name. The theme that we have for the month of June 2020 in Olive Tree Parish, Redeemed Christian Church of God, is In Step with God. And it's also the title of the message I want to share with us today. Let's have a word of prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Father, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people again. Every opportunity you give me to speak to your people is an opportunity to be a blessing and to be blessed myself. I pray that the Holy Spirit will take total control. Precious, sweet Holy Spirit, I let go and I let God. Please come and speak through me. Come and influence and transform lives through the word of life you will share through what I will say today. Let your name alone be glorified. And let all the honor go to you and the blessings be ours, Father. For in Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. Like I said, the title of the message I have for us, which is also the theme for the month, is In Step with God. And the background to the message is um, taken um, from the text in the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. John 17, 20 to 21. And I'll read from the New Living Translation. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. Like I said, our theme for the month, In Step With God, is one that when you view it in the context of the main text, John chapter 17, verses 20 to 21, is a vast one. It touches on several important aspects of practical Christianity, of living Christianity in a practical way, that we'll be meditating on this month. Some of the key tenets of our faith that we'll be exploring and meditating on this month include discipleship, praying the heart of the Father, prayer and praying the heart of the Father, unity in the church, and also unity with God. Other dimensions of the theme in step with God, which God willing, we will explore in the weeks ahead, include walking in the footsteps of Jesus and the alignment of interest principle. Let us remember that becoming one with God or in step with God is the main overarching theme that we'll be studying this month. Now, let me go through the message outline before I go into the message proper. I've um, divided the message into four parts. One, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Two, Jesus prayed the heart of the Father. Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 told us what matters to the Father and the Son. Three, unity in the church is essential for effective Christian ministry and witnessing. And then number four, unity with God is the heartbeat of God. Unity with God is the heartbeat of God. Now let's get into the message with that question. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? The online encyclopedia, which is called Wikipedia, defines disciple as follows. In Christianity, disciple primarily refers to a dedicated follower of Jesus. This term is found in the New Testament only in the Gospels and the Book of Acts. In the ancient world, a disciple is a follower or adherent of a teacher. It is not the same as being a student in the modern sense. A disciple in the ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and teaching of the master. It was a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. A Christian disciple is a believer who follows Christ and then offers his own imitation of Christ as a model for others to follow. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, New Living Translation, And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. A disciple is first a believer who has exercised faith. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 38. Acts 2, 37 to 38. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. This means for one to become a disciple, they have, they have experienced conversion and put Jesus at the center of their life and participated in rites of Christian imitation. A fully developed disciple is also a leader of others who attempts to pass on this faith to his followers with the goal of repeating this process. This is what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, and also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The question for you, therefore, is, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Do you believe in Christ? Have you experienced genuine conversion and the new birth, where you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And having accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, are you now prepared to be a genuine disciple? Remember, a disciple is a dedicated follower of Jesus. I remember the story of Daniel in the Old Testament and his example in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, where he determined in his heart not to follow the Babylonian way, but the way of the Lord God of Israel. The Bible says Daniel determined in his heart that he will not partake of the king's delicacies and the king's meat, but he chose to follow the God of Israel. A Christian disciple is a believer who follows Christ and then offers his own imitation of Christ as a model for others to follow. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Let me share a more recent example. You know, a few years ago, I was working in Victoria Island at the time, you know, and I shared an office. I was working in the same office or the same set of offices with my younger brother, Pastor John in Nelama. And, you know, we used to disciple a group of young men who were working in the same sort of in the vicinity in, uh, in, in, you know, with us. You know, we called it the Values Club. The whole idea is that we met regularly, at least once a month, where we talked about the practical issues of living the Christian faith in the marketplace. And it turned out to be quite an impactful ministry. In fact, I would say that we learned a lot from this group of young men that were discipling, even though I would say that like, we had the primary responsibility of, you know, trying to make them disciples based on our own experience. And I share this to say that, like, this is something, this is a life to be lived, you know, and you and I can make a choice today to become genuine disciples of Jesus. Why don't you make a commitment today to go all the way with Jesus and become a genuine disciple that will walk in the footsteps of Jesus? You know, my own commitment, you know, something I've been meditating on lately is, you know, I want to be my utmost for the highest. I want to be my utmost for his highest. You know, and I got this from, you know, uh, um, um, the teachings and the writing of um, Oswald Chambers, who lived more than 100 years ago. Let me give you a quote from Oswald Chambers, and then I'll tell you um, a testimony that I write about as I was preparing for this message. This quote goes this way, and it's from Oswald Chambers. Shut out every consideration and keep yourself before God for this one thing only, my utmost for his highest. You know, there's a story that is told of Oswald Chambers in his biography. You know, like I said, he lived more than 100 years ago. He was a British Christian minister, an evangelist and missionary. Who lived, at, who lived in Egypt at the time? He was actually part of the uh, y, YMCA. You know, he was the chaplain of the soldiers who were fighting in the First World War in, 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 you know, about 100 years ago. You know, and the story goes that when Chambers told a group of fellow YMCA workers that he had decided to abandon concerts and movies for Bible classes for, his, you know, for the people who were discipling, those soldiers, they predicted this is colleagues predicted the exodus of those soldiers from his facilities. What the skeptics had not considered was Chambers' unusual personal appeal, his gift in speaking, and his genuine concern for the men he discipled. Soon, his wooden framed hut was packed with hundreds of soldiers, listening to all manner of messages that he preached to them, such as, what is the good of prayer? Confronted by one of those soldiers who said, I can't stand religious people. Chambers replied, neither can I. You know, in other words, here was a man that taught us that people are hungry for God. People are hungry to hear from God. Let me give you a more recent testimony to drive this point home. You know, recently I met with some of the younger ministers and workers in Olive Street Parish. And I was meeting with them, you know, to discuss how we can move the church forward. How we can, you know, have a greater impact how we can, you know, uh, refresh and strengthen, you know, the work of the church in our community. And what struck me and what really touched me was the main thrust of what their feedback to me and what they said they desired was to see the church 
you know, commit to absolute devotedness to God. They wanted a church that was absolutely devoted to God. They wanted a, a church where God alone was preached. It reminds me of what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added. A lot of the problems and challenges people face, if we teach them God, if they know God and are devoted to God, God will bring solutions because God is a master when it comes to providing solutions to the issues of men. Let somebody praise the Lord. So, you know, what we are talking about today is crucial. How do we become disciples and make disciples of other men? As you know, this is the subject of the Great Commission that Jesus left with the church. And I pray that you and I will not be slack concerning making disciples of men in Jesus' mighty name and being effective and genuine disciples ourselves. Let's go on with the message. The second thing Jesus prayed about is that Jesus prayed the heart of the Father. He prayed the heart of the Father. John chapter 17, verses 1, 20 and 21. John 17, verses 1, 20 and 21. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Verse 20. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. John chapter 17 is titled Jesus' Final Prayer in the New Living Translation Study Bible. This was the final prayer that Jesus prayed before his betrayal, crucifixion, and death. When we examine the content of Jesus' of Jesus's all-important prayer to the Father before his arrest, crucifixion, and death, we gain a clear understanding of what is important to Jesus, the legacy he wanted, and also what is important to God the Father. You know, let's look at some of the points that uh, Jesus prayed about, or some of the points or some of the things he prayed about. Number one, Jesus not only prayed for his disciples at that time, but for all who will ever believe in him. John chapter 17 verse 20, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. In other words, Jesus prayed for the church, for you and for I. And, and Jesus prayed for Christians of all ages, past, present, and future. We are the church. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Romans 8, 34, that it is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Therefore, Jesus not only prayed for us, but he's still interceding and praying for us. He still intercedes for us in the presence of the Father. This should be a source of encouragement to you and to me, that we are not in this journey alone. We are not in this battle alone. Jesus is right with us. Jesus has got our back. You know, let's continue with the prayers of Jesus in John chapter 17. The next prayer Jesus prayed was for the unity of the church. Jesus prayed for the unity of the church. Jesus prayed for a united church. Jesus said, I pray that they will all be one. Our unity matters to Jesus and matters to God. Brethren, a divided church does not bring God glory. A church where there is strife and division, backbiting, and you know, people you know, just walking as rivals rather than in union does not bring glory to God. Does not bring glory to God. Our lives and the church must bring glory to God. I read a piece recently by Bob Gass that underscores or that emphasizes the importance of living our lives in a way that brings God glory. Let me share that piece with us. And the title of this piece is Your Growth, God's Glory. Your Growth, God's Glory. To Him be glory, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, NIV. To Him be glory, 2 Peter 3, 18, NIV. After writing, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Peter adds, To Him be glory. Your biggest reason for wanting to grow spiritually should not be to get it right or look good personally. No, it should be that God may be glorified in your living. Paul writes, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, why should we keep our flesh in check or watch our attitudes to glorify God before others? The problem is our emphasis is on what we are doing instead of focusing on God and his glory. The word glory refers to something or someone of great worth. So what, we are, what, so what are we supposed to do? Draw attention to God. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. 
draw the attention and the glory to God. Promote him. God wants to go public. Since he's invisible, he has created people whose full-time job is to make him visible so that the world might be drawn to him. A company intent on promoting itself doesn't settle for a small ad buried in the yellow pages. It may start that way, but the idea is to grow into something bigger so that more people will be reached. We are billboards advertising God's grace to a lost world. He wants us to grow so that we can display him more. In fact, God has entrusted his public image to us. Glorifying him is our most awesome privilege and responsibility. Unless you think this is overstating the case, Paul writes, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, NIV. God is passionate about his glory. Why grow, you ask? Because spiritual growth increases your capacity to bring God glory. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in Psalm 133, Psalm 133, that it is in the midst of unity that God commands his blessing. It is in the midst of our unity that God brings down his blessing. Unity is vital. Unity of the church is vital for the growth of the church and for the blessedness of the church. You know, here's another write-up on why the unity of the church is so important. Here's another write-up I read as one of my preparation, you know, for this message I'm sharing with us today on why the unity of the church is so vital, you know, for, for, for the growth of the church. Unity in the Christian church has been a challenging thing since the earliest days of Christianity. The importance of getting Christianity, the importance of getting Christian belief and behavior right, coupled with the open to interpretation nature of much of scripture, leads to very strong feelings and uncompromising convictions on all manner of Christian theology and praxis. Another challenge to unity is geographical and cultural diversity. Unlike other more regional religions, which are buttressed by sheer geographical or cultural identity, Christianity has since the beginning been global and transcultural. This means that local cultures and contexts create a multiplicity of Christian identities and permutations. The shape of Christian practice, say in Korea or a Nigerian megachurch, first looks different from a Pentecostal church in the United States. Unity amidst such diversity is one of the most brilliant and yet challenging things about Christianity. But it is a challenge we must continually take up. Why? Here are just three reasons why we must pursue unity in the church and amongst Christians as brethren. Number one, it is theologically crucial. It is theologically crucial. This is what Christ taught his disciples. Jesus passionately prayed that his followers will be one and may be brought to complete unity. John chapter 17, verse 21 and verse 23, NIV. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me, he prayed in John chapter 17, verse 21. Their unity was rooted in Christ's own unity with the Father. An idea Paul picks up in his own writings about unity and oneness. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul had much to say about the importance of unity as a product and proof of the gospel. And he underscores it in his regular use of sibling and family language when he's dealing with divisions in churches. Whether it be the Jew-Gentile divisions of the Roman church or the status divisions of Corinth. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. As one Christian author notes, if there was one place in the Asian world where a person could expect to encounter a united front, it was the descent group, or what you might call the linear descendants of one ancestor. For example, a family of blood brothers and sisters. For Paul, the church is such a family. As such, unity must prevail. One way this is practically embodied is in material solidarity. For example, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4, 
and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and Romans chapter 15, verses 26 to 27. For Paul, this is a tangible expression of the uniting of Jew and Gentile as siblings in God's eternal family. And alleviating a brother's poverty is, first and foremost, a family responsibility. Let's deal with the second reason why the unity of the church is so vital. It is a powerful witness. The unity of the church becomes a powerful witness. A united church is one of the strongest evidences of the truth of the gospel. This is especially true in a world as fragmented and divisive as ours, where countercultural unity among diverse people stands out. When the rest of the world can't seem to agree on anything or bear to be around people who are different, a church where natural enemies become siblings in Christ is a powerful alternative. Unity is a critical manifestation of a spirit-empowered church. That's why Paul told the Ephesian Christians to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. It is why he wrote to the Corinthians, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Where division might normally reign, unity should instead lead to an uncommon love where believers listen to and bear with one another. By these, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, said Jesus, if you have love for one another. In John chapter 13, verse 35. Let's go to the third reason why the unity of the church is so necessary and so vital. There is a common enemy. We have to be united as a church, as Christians, because we are facing a common enemy. Highs and lows in the history of church unity tend to correspond to the presence or absence of persecution. When things are comfy for the church, it finds reason to squabble and divide. When persecution arises, unity takes on a bit more urgency. As the church faces persecution in Nigeria and elsewhere, the need for a united church is even more urgent. The role of the church in bringing about a transformed nation means that we must unite to face the common enemy of corruption, wickedness, iniquity, and lawlessness in the land. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now let's go on to the third part of the message I have for us today. Jesus prayed that we may be one with God. Jesus prayed that we may be one with God. In other words, Jesus prayed that we may be in step with God, which is also the title of my message to us, in step with God. John chapter 17, verse 21. John 17, 21. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. In the model prayer, in the Lord's prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, specifically in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, Jesus taught his disciples to pray for us to our Father in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us, his disciples, to pray that we will do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. How do we make doing God's will in God's way our priority? How do you and I make doing God's will in God's way our priority? How do we even know God's will and God's ways? How do we understand the ways of God, the things that please Him, the things that He expects of us? How can we walk in step, in consonance, in alignment with God? It is this crucial part of the Lord's final prayer that we may be one with God the Father and God the Son, who are already one, that will form the meat of our meditation for the month of June. Let me outline some of the basic principles that are necessary if we are to truly walk in step with God, if we are to be one with God. Number one, if we are to walk in step with God, if we are to be one with God, we must each make a quality decision to be genuine disciples and be prepared to pay the price that it takes to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We must each make a quality decision to be one with God. We must each make a quality decision to be genuine disciples and be prepared to pay the price that it takes to walk in the footsteps of Jesus if we are to be one with God. You know, some of the examples from the Old Testament inspire me. Look at the story of Joseph and the price he paid and the temptations he overcame. Look at the story of Daniel and the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel and the price they paid 
and the temptations they overcame. They didn't do it on their own. I'm sure the Spirit of God helped them. But we are now in the dispensation of grace. Paul said, it is by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me is not in vain. I pray that the grace of God will help you and the grace of God will help me, you know, to make a quality decision, you know, to pay whatever the price is to be a genuine disciple of Jesus. The second thing we must do if we are to walk in step with God is we must know the word of God. We must know the word of God, which means we must spend quality time in the word of God. We must meditate on the word of God day and night, as the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 and also in Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3. We must meditate on the word of God day and night. Jesus came down from heaven and became human and taught us his word. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the word. Jesus is called the word. Jesus preached and taught us the word of God. And this is clearly documented in the Bible. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 24, Proverbs 19 24, lazy people take food in the, in the hand, in their hand, but, I do, but don't even lift it to their mouth. Proverbs 19 24 says lazy people take food in their hand, but don't even lift it to their mouth. You know, what this is telling us, brethren, is that we must not be lazy in consuming the food of life, the bread of life, the word of God. You know, because the word of God is so available, it's like food in our hand and refusing to put it in our mouth, refusing to digest the word of God, refusing to meditate on the word of God, to know the word of God is akin to a man who has food in his hand, is hungry and out of laziness, refuses to put the food in his mouth. May that not be your portion, may that not be my portion in Jesus' name. We must digest the word of God, we must meditate on it day and night, because it is the word of God that will bring the abundant life that Jesus spoke about in John 10, 10. He said, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the third thing we must do, if we are to walk in step with God, if we are to be one with God, is that we must invite the Holy Spirit to be our companion. We must invite the Holy Spirit to be our companion. We must invite the Holy Spirit to be our guide. And we must invite the Holy Spirit as our helper. That's what the Bible tells us in John chapter 14, verse 16. And also in John 14, 26. Also in John 16, verse 7. You know, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father. And will guide us on what to do if we ask Him. That's what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. The Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father. And will guide us on what to do if we ask Him. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. In fact, I believe we can practice God consciousness to the point where our thoughts and the meditations of our heart will flow with the mind and the will of God. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless in John 14, 18. In other words, God has sent us the comforter. Jesus has sent us another comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, he's our counselor, he's our strengthener, he's our teacher, he's our helper. And we must always avail ourselves of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John eleven thirteen, If any father has been evil, give good gifts to their children. How much more will our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit if we ask Him? You and I must continually, constantly ask God for the Holy Spirit. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Remember that a genuine disciple, when fully formed, becomes a living copy of the Master. A genuine disciple, when fully formed, becomes a living copy of the Master. I pray that you and I will become genuine disciples and living copies of the Master today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Will you make a commitment? to yourself and to God, to be more and more like Jesus? Will you make a commitment today to yourself and to God to be more and more like Jesus, to be in step with Jesus, to be in sync with Jesus by the working of the Holy Spirit in your life? If you do and you welcome the Holy Spirit, you'll be amazed how far the Holy Spirit and the grace of God will take you and what he will make of you. I believe that I have not seen, ear has not heard, Neither has it come into the heart of man what God has reserved for those of us that love him, for those of us that want to be like him, for those of us that want to walk in step with God, for those of us that want to be one with God. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you for the word you have laid in my heart to share with your people. Father, even as I have shared this word, please go and multiply this word in our hearts. Father, prosper this word in our hearts. Let these words be profitable to us. Let these words not stand in judgment against us. But let these words help us to be true, genuine disciples that will walk in step with God, that will be one with God. Father, my prayer today is that every one of us, including myself, by the help of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, will walk this walk and not just be hearers of the word, but will be doers of the word. We will meditate on the word of God and we will live out the word of God as genuine disciples of Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Now, if you have listened to this message and you do not yet know Jesus Christ as Lord, I would like to pray specially for you. Because the first step is actually accepting Jesus as Lord before you go on to become a true disciple. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, as many as are listening to me right now who have chosen to make a quality commitment to follow and to accept and follow Jesus Christ as Lord, I am praying for each and every one of them now, Father, that you will go and dwell in their hearts, that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon them. My prayer, Father, is that as many as have confessed their sins today, as many as are willing to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, will receive him right now in Jesus' mighty name. And the Holy Spirit will dwell in their hearts. Father, I pray that you will write their names in the book of life and that the Holy Spirit will help them to walk this walk and to go on this journey by the grace of God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation. Take all the honor and all the glory, Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Father, I also want to thank you for helping me to share your word. Please continue with us. Give us more grace. Give us more of your grace, day by day. May we go from grace to grace, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. I love you. God bless you. Thank you.